it's recording. Uh, and welcome to Winnow's World. Uh, my name's Robert Winston, or Winnow, as uh, most people know me. Um, I'm here with the legendary Ricky Nixon. How are you, Winnow? Welcome, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, mate. Um, thanks for joining us, mate. Now, I'm uh, just going to be asking you a few questions today, just about your, uh, obviously, your uh, sports management career and also your um, AFL slash VFL career. Um, now, Ricky, you were born 3rd of April, 1963, 55 yes. years of age. That's it. Currently, mate. And um, you grew up in the town of Bendigo, mate. Um, do you want to tell the viewers just a little, little bit about your uh, childhood growing up through the ranks and how you fell in love with the game of AFL? And um, when did you, or when did the, um, the scouters start noticing you had a little bit of talent in the game and in, in the junior ranks and how, how it all worked out? in your childhood, mate. It's actually interesting you should say, because only in the last 24 hours I was listening on the radio and they were talking about you know the amount of depression in today's society and mental health and everything, yep. and talking about how it relates back to your childhood a lot. Okay. Um, and uh, yesterday I was uh, driving from Tarelgan to, to uh, Alexandra, which is up near Mount Elam, to do okay. a footy club show. Yeah. And I used to, 30 years ago, I used to teach prep, people wouldn't know this, at Marysville Primary School. Where am I going with all this? As I drove up there, it was bringing back memories of teaching and all that. And I started yep. thinking about Bendigo. I grew up in Bendigo with a little fat kid, you'll hate me saying it, Greg Williams, who <laughs> was a reasonable footballer, went on to win a couple of Brownlow medals. And um, yeah. I actually learnt something when I was 15. Uh, Tony Southcombe, who was a footballer, grabbed Greg and I and said, I'm going to make you into AFL footballers. I'm going to make you run up this hill, one tree hill every night, okay. which we did. And um, the hill was about four kilometres to the top. And uh, uh, I was a little athletics champion, ran up there the first night. And okay. um, he said, well, I'm going to make you the fittest kids in Australia. That'll make you play AFL footy. Took Greg 28 days to get to the top. When he got to the top, I said, well done, mate. And he stood up and I'll never forget what he said. He said, Rick, why do you always run to the top of the mountain? And I said, because that's where Tony told us to run to. And he said, but you're better than that. The next day I ran to the top nine kilometers around the bush tracks back to my parents' house. Did it every day for 18 months till I played AFL footy. Oh, wow, okay. So it taught me a valuable lesson in your childhood. Yep. Don't let anything beat you. Just keep fighting back all the time and yep. keep, keep, go beyond what you're actually, where your limit is, I suppose. Try and go beyond push, it. Push, uh, push beyond uh, what your limits are, yep. I should say. Now, uh, Rick, mate, um, question I did want to ask you, take us back to the mid 1980s. Uh, what was it like uh, as a semi-professional footballer at the time while being a, a full-time physical education teacher at Kerry Grammar? Well, I think the thing is, and I know people always say, you know, I wish we could go back to yesterday. You can't, so you, you're better off planning for the future. But you know, through the 80s was, I think, a very special time. Yep. I mean, you could play AFL football or VFL when it was back then, I suppose. Yep. Um, you could still have a drink on Saturday night and Sundays with your mates. You can enjoy, I, I really felt that, that my best mates were the guys I played with at Carlton, which was through the 80s more. Um, and, and it's really because you had this mateship of socialising with people. These days we don't seem to even socialise. The days of house parties don't happen anymore and things no. like that. And um, You know, it's not going to reverse back. But, you know, it was a great time when you could also have a job, which I had, teaching yeah. physical education, go to football training at the Mighty yeah. Carlton Footy Club every night. Yeah. And, um, you know, play with superstars and legends, you know, whether it was players like, you know, Mike Fitzpatrick who became chairman of the AFL or Mark McClure or yep. Jimmy Buckley or Alex Marcu and all these great names, Rod Ashman, etc. Yep. It was so like I felt like this kid intimidated by how good they were. Yeah. Was there any um kids at Kerry Grammar that you, you taught back back in the eighties who came through the ranks and played at either A, a high level or actually made the, the top level of the game in the AFL? It was probably a little bit more later on. A few like Andrew Gaff is a well-known name at the moment. He's been in the headlines a little bit. Yep. Gaffy was a Carey boy. Um, Darcy Moore became Darcy a Carey. Moore. I coached okay. Darcy Moore, actually, myself. Um, in fact, the irony is is that I coached Darcy Moore and a kid, Mark Pitney. Mark Pitney, people wouldn't, a lot of people wouldn't know who he is, but he's actually at Hawthorne. He's a ruckman. He's played the last few games. Okay. Well, he, is, he, is he a young player? Isn't yeah, he? young. he's been there a few years, but he's been held back by McAvoy and the ruckman that they've had there, Segler and that. But uh, the one that's come out this year out of the blocks, but I always knew when I coached him, he was a, a Jet, is Billy Gowers. At Billy Gowers. Yeah. yeah, he's a good um, So I've, I've had three kids I coached who were playing AFL. There wouldn't be a lot of junior coaches who have had three out of no. one team. I actually reckon there's a couple of others who haven't been identified who could play AFL as well. Are you currently coaching as we spoke? No, I, look, this was um, probably now oh, nearly 10 years ago. 10 probably, years ago. Probably, probably eight years ago. Okay. Um, look, uh, I'd like to coach again, but the problem is, is you can't be doing everything. Coaching takes up a lot of time. I can imagine. I can imagine so. Uh, now, out of your career, obviously, uh, 83 to 85, you played at Carlton. Four games, one goal. 86 to 91, 
played at St Kilda, mostly majority of football, 51 goal, uh, sorry, 51 games and 32 goals, and then you finish it off uh, between 92 and 93 Hawthorne, eight games and six goals. What was your favourite time? At which club do you feel like you played your best football and and also mainly enjoyed? Yeah, you know, being around a football club and enjoyed playing your football. I guess the irony they all delivered me something that contributed to when I became a player manager, and that was that. My best football was at St Kilda because I played my most games and that. But uh, by being at Carlton and Hawthorne, the two, probably two, arguably the two out of the top four most successful clubs of all time. Yeah. When I went to Carlton, they won three premierships in four years. So forget about how they are now. Yeah. Back when I was there, the connections and networks I built in business and all that are still there today. Yeah. And the same at Hawthorne, the success, you know, getting to know a Jeff Kennett, employing his daughter. Um, yeah. All those sort of things are just vast networks that you could never dream about, I suppose. Yeah. When I went into play management, I argue I was such a bad footballer that over 11, <laughs> 11 years I played at three clubs, but it gave me three networks to tap yeah. into. If I just played at Hawthorne, I would have only had one club. Yeah. And I'm not so sure it would have been very as easy as it sort of was at the start. Okay. Or luckier it was at the start. Okay. Now, Ricky, uh, your career finished in 93 uh, and a year after that you started your sports management business flying start now I've been really intrigued by you know back in the early to mid 90s this wasn't even a concept really in Australia you know they, uh, if you compare it to the American sports you know they had that type of business yeah. but you were literally a pioneer in this industry um, so just elaborate on that and, and how uh, you actually originally came up with the concept of the idea yeah. and um, and just talk about the passion and, and how it all began. Yeah, well, I guess the biggest thing that ignited it all was um, a basketballer called Michael Jordan. Um, I well, was fascinated by the fact he didn't just play basketball, he became an off-field sensation, off-court perhaps, where Nike signed him to, and, and, and like I remember reading it, you know, he got a million dollar deal, he probably got 30 million, I can't remember. Yeah. But to see that sort of money, and, and it was three times more than what he was getting for playing and things like that, and then he'd sign a deal with a TV network, and it's like, wow, why isn't that happening yeah. in Australia? Um, so I wasn't the first player agent. There was there was some accountants and lawyers and that doing it very part time and things yep. like that. But what I was was the first person to actually earn a player money off the field, a decent amount of money. So was I lucky finding Wayne Carey? Probably, yep. but you know he's probably lucky to find me as well. Okay, okay. <laughs> so okay, but you know yep. you earn um, you know it, it was a great partnership because you know he performed on the field and I performed off for him. Okay. And, you know we did deals with Nike. We did deals with Foxtel. That had never been heard of before, Telstra. Yeah. And these sort of companies, uh, 4 and 20 pies, massive ad. I remember huge, yeah. James Hurd and Wayne Carey, and I think it might have been Jason Dunstall hitting 4 and 20 pies. Imagine Dustin Martin saying he eats 4 and 20 pies now to play footy. <laughs> right, yeah, he probably probably wouldn't look as good in his nah. Bond Jocks as he, if he yeah. was in the old 4 and 20 pies, mate. Now, um, uh, back in the mid 90s, you started a, uh, a club called Club 10. Now, this was your marquee Club 10. Just to mention a few names, Ablett, Dunstall, Carey, Lockett, obviously they're probably the four main ones. Yep. And to elaborate, there was, I think, was it Matty Richardson as well? Yeah, he came in a little bit later on, but um, what happened was the oh, AFL yeah. uh, actually asked to have a meeting with me and Jeff Brown, who was a legal advisor, went on to become the CEO of Channel 9, actually, him and Ross Oakley. So I, the irony in all this is I see Ross Oakley every morning now having coffee downstairs at the cafe. Yeah. Um, they approached me and said, look, our view is if we fight you, it's not going to end well because yep. our agents weren't in, but basically agents like me didn't exist in Australia. And they said, we know it's the future. So we want to, um, I guess for a word, embrace you and see if we can work with you. So we're going to send you to America and okay. we're going to set up meetings with the NBL, the NFL, the baseball, all of them. So people don't know, but the AFL actually sent me to America. I mean, I had right. to pay for my own trip, but they set up these meetings for me. And they were very, very um, great to me in the early days. But when I was over there, I saw this thing called the Quarterback Club. And the Quarterback Club was okay. literally what it says. It had 10 of the best quarterbacks in this group. And they sold it as a group to, say, for example, the, the Telstra of America or the Foxtel of America. And I went, wow, why aren't we doing that in Australia? So yeah. when I came back, I didn't manage all of the players in Club 10, but their agents agreed to put them in Club 10. Okay. And I managed Club 10, I suppose. So yeah. A good example would have been Tony Modd early days. I wasn't managing him, but his agent in Adelaide put him in Club okay. 10. And the players loved it. They, and then um, unfortunately the AFL wanted to own it though, um, and I manage it, and I didn't quite agree with that. So I took them on, took the licensees. Who, at that stage on the registration form down the bottom in the smallest print ever, it said you assign your intellectual property rights to the AFL oh, right. for the length okay. of your contract. 
And I said, no, that's not right, that can't happen. So unbeknown to most professional athletes in Australia, um, and thanks to my wife as well, who, who we mortgaged our house to take the AFL to court, and they settled wow. outside court. Every professional athlete in Australia now owns their own professional, their, uh, their IP, their intellectual property, their identity, yep. their signature, all that. They own it, and the AFL or the okay. cricket for Australia. They can sell it, but you have to make sure the player gets 80% of the money back. Okay. Um, now, Ricky, um, I'm not sure how you're going with this currently, but uh, in the 2014 open mic interview, you did say quotes uh, from you, um, uh, <laughs> Flying Start will rise from the ashes. Um, now, how I've done a little bit of research. Uh, I believe it's an online business. Now, how uh, elaborate on that? How is Flying Start going? Yeah, I guess currently? my when I made that statement, it was me hell bent on proving everyone wrong and getting it okay. right and all that, and my son coming in and perhaps managing players and me godfathering it a bit. Um, what it did was we created a, a around Australia local footy recruiting program. Which, look, did pretty well, but it's, it's not where I see the future now. Um, okay. Um, my future is, and I, I can't go exactly into it because it hasn't been made public yet, okay. but I'll be, be no, involved right. helping players, um, with ex-players with injuries. I get four million bucks of funding now a year, which is not each player. But is that obviously, uh, supplied by the AFL? Yeah, the AFL pays the money to the AFL Players Association. AFL, if you're yeah. a player who played in 1952 and yep. you lay, you know, you can play, barely walk, you've got a crook knee from playing AFL, yep. you can now get up to $8,000 a year to um, get that injury fixed. And 8000 would cover a knee reconstruction or something like that, okay. and also dental. So, look, this has been long overdue. I know myself, I, I, I've got certain things that, you know, I go, oh, God, that bloody elbow, you know, I must get that fixed. But you don't know where to go, you don't know what to do, you don't know the processes, and you can't be bothered half the time. So now I'm going to take that out of their hands. Okay. Um, now, on a bit more of a sadder note, um, a guy by the name uh, Up and Coming sportscaster, commentator, uh, and basically all around talented uh, media personality, Clinton Gribus. Um, I know that's probably a little bit of a uh, personal thing for me to touch on, mate, but just tell me about how talented the guy was, because I remember watching Fox yeah. footy, you know, I was approximately 17 years or 18 years of age when he did pass. Um, but what, I mean, well, where do you reckon he would have been these days? Oh, I, mean, God, I think he was one of the, like, people talk about Wayne Carey, but he was the off-field of Wayne Carey. He was the biggest talent in the media I'd ever seen. Yeah. And at the time, keep in mind, Rex Hunt was around, Bruce McAbee, yeah. he was, you know, in perhaps his more middle-range years, I suppose. Um, some of these huge names, um, Sandy Roberts, people like that. I went and heard him call the basketball of the ABC. I went, wow, this bloke's different. I don't know what it was about him, but it was like me watching, I guess, a young Wayne Carey take a screamer and then dodge around on his left foot and go bang from 60. Yeah. It was like that. And, um, you know, I signed him up and said to him, how much you're on? He said, 30 grand. I said, I'll get you 300 grand within a year. Yeah. Within a year, he was earning a million dollars. A million dollars. He was base of Foxtel. He was on 3AW. I remember, yeah. And even Rex Hunt, to his credit, Rex and I have had chats recently, and Rex goes, there's no way... I was so gun ho in the day and I was very popular, but Clinton came along and balanced it up and, and we were a great team. And, you know, he passed away at 31, 32 from, you know, what we think was probably a brain hemorrhage. Um, and, yeah, it was shattering at the time. Yeah, it was. It was uh, huge news. Okay. Um, okay, now... Uh, that doesn't matter because I can edit it. That's all right. All good. Just while what? Make sure it's going. Yeah, it's going. Yeah. Yeah. I might even just straighten it up a bit. Beautiful thing with these, they're all wide, wide view cameras. Yeah. Oh, and I think you can edit, bring them in, can't you, or something? Yeah, yeah. so that's all right. No problem. You're doing well, mate. Um, okay, I won't push for too much longer. Maybe okay. just, uh, I'll, I'll just, you can edit this in, but I'll just keep going with Clinton Gribus just for a second. Yeah. If that's all right. So when Clinton passed away, it was a massive, massive shock to me. And, you know, people who hear me speak on every, pretty much every weekend at footy clubs will know the impact that had on my life. Um, where, you know, I told him to go and see the doctor and, you know, six, eight days later he was dead. Yeah. And I don't think he went to the doctor and I, I must admit I did my head in over that. Yeah. Um, still to this day, even talking about it now, it brings back memories that I don't like because I don't want it, that to ever happen again. And, yeah. um, you know, it is the way I relate it on Saturday nights is, is if you've got a mate who's got problems, uh, don't just assume he's gone and got help because probably 99% of the time they haven't. Because we all say, you know, we've got help and everything. Like, say, um, yeah. we'll be right kind of Correct. And even on Friday, I was at a thing called the Dude's Lunch. It's D triple zero uh, O. 
do he stands for day, Dad's Day out of the office, um, uh, okay. out of the office day, rather. And um, what it's about is just um, how many times blokes t- particularly don't check on their mates, you know. Yeah. And you know it is getting bigger that mental health area. And um, you know I went through a really bad period for a long time, but yeah. you know luckily I've come out the other side, and and that's a lot to do with my growing up and having to get up one field that I described before. Yeah, you know? no, it's that's fantastic, Ricky. There are uh, Ricky. Look, uh, the, the game, the modern game, in my opinion, is a great spe- spectacle to watch because it is so professional. You know, they do all the extras, the ice baths, the, the stretches. You know, extra training in the preseason. Now, just uh, what's your opinion? Uh, what do you think of the current AFL game as a spectacle, um, as far as the players are concerned? All the different points of view. You know, how do you view the game? You know, as you, as you talk about the game, the mid ages was a fun time yeah. to play. Yeah. But how do you actually view the game in the current, look, I, current I'm not, time? I'm not a fan of this congestion game. Um, it's interesting when I hear players say that they think the game shouldn't be changed and the rules and that. But they've been taught to play the game how it is today. Yeah, that's right. They're not spectators who have been following the game for 30 years. And, you know, I hear, I think if it wasn't for the fact at the moment that the AFL fixtures contrived to make sure Collingwood and Richmond finish up the top, and people probably don't even know that, but it yeah. is and it's a fact because it underwrites a lot of the, you know, financial uh, stuff that the AFL's trying to do with women's football and the St Kilda's and the Western Bulldogs who need the money. So I don't fault the AFL for that. They're running a business yeah. and that's their job. Um, but at the end of the day, um, is the game great to watch? I don't think it is. The fact that it's close at the moment and that that's what's drawing people to the yeah. game. But I'd hate to think if a Richmond and a Collingwood get so powerful um, that the St Kilda's and Western Bulldogs can't even exist anymore. So okay. it's not an easy job that Gill and the boys have got at the AFL. It's a really hard balancing act. And I think the other thing that contributes to all this is um, the magical, and I'll use yours, uh, these things. <laughs> These yeah, days, like. they've taken more. They're more entertaining than going to watch AFL footy. We all spend our lives on it. You've got a partner, and probably you and you both sit at home and you're both on it. Just went to lunch with mine. We and I said, well, let's put these bloody phones well, down. Well, if you, I mean, if you walk just down the, the main street here, yeah. people, I, I can even know from experience. I walk down the street in the straight line, and I've deliberately yeah. walked into people because they don't. No yeah. one, no one observes where they're going these days, Ricky. And I think what it is when I grew up in Bendigo, the biggest fascination, the biggest excitement in my life was AFL football. It was. And wanting to play it, but also watching it. I couldn't get enough of it, you know. Yep. Now, the biggest excitement in your life is your mobile phone. Football, for some people, could be back as far as 10. For some, it could be back as far yep. as 100 now, um, when it used to be number one. So I think the answer to a bit is that I, if we try to be, think we're going to be number one again, it's not going to happen. The world's changed. Yep. Um, look, I don't know if this is... It's a big statement, but AFL football within 20 years may not exist. And I'm not talking because of the entertainment, but I'm talking because of the concussion situation and finding out that the damage that's been done to people playing this game as a contact sport can't, can't keep happening. Well, um, example of that, well, from what I've observed and studied is uh, even someone like Greg Williams. Yep. Um, uh, he's got brain injury, or yep. he's, I, don't, I, don't know, I think that's a true statement. Um, yeah, no, look, he's um, probably my best mate growing up. We grew up together. Yep. Um, it's shattering to know a few years ago that you know, he couldn't remember any of his teammates who he played with any games he remembered me only because i grew up with him at school and look he, he has improved significantly greg with some medication but that's good but Indeed. we don't but he doesn't know and i don't know and we all don't know where's he going to be in five years where's he going to be in 10 years and there's nothing worse than and i'm having a bit of it myself lately just short-term memory loss and you yeah. start the more you think about it the more it actually makes it worse so i'm trying to say don't worry yeah. about it ricky you're just getting older um <laughs> don't do yeah. your head in about it um, and look, a lot of it might have to do with lifestyle a bit these days too and what, what we're all doing off, off the field. Well, yeah, well, off the field, I think the problem is most people don't do enough. They don't, they don't walk. People, I mean... I, I, I absolutely 100% agree with you on that, Winner, and I'm glad you've raised it because um, I discussed this on the weekend with a, a prominent entertainer, I won't name him, about how he said he has depression and I said so do some family, mm. friends and connections. And I argue it's because they stay in bed, they sleep too much. And they find when you're tired, you can't get up. Whereas I find the minute I wake up, just get up and get going. Get going. And I've never had those problems in my life. Now, whether it's just genetic or whether it's just luck, yeah. but I think a lot of it has to do with your sleep patterns these days. And um, people are staying up later, staying on their phones. We wake up in the night, what's the yeah. first thing we do? Grab our phone, check our phone, 100%. go to the toilet, check our phone. It creates a disturbing sleep pattern. Whereas it's if you're like, it's yeah. LED life. Yeah, yeah things like that, is it? Yeah. 100%. 100%. percent. Now, uh, Ricky. Uh, thanks for answering that question on the AFL, mate. There, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. That no, doesn't matter. That's all good. Um, can you ever see an AFL team in Tasmania? 
I can't. Um, the reason being, and I love Tassie, and, I, and I'll go down there quite a bit, and a lot of my fr a lot of good friends are down there. Um, is Tassie only has a population of I think it's seven hundred thousand. It might even be less. Yep. I mean, there's more people in Geelong, just about. Yeah, that's right. So. Well, it looks like it's an ideal place because of, you know, it's sort of a separate state. Well, it is a separate state. It's an island. Um, they love their footy. They're passionate. Of course it I just do. comes down to numbers. I mean, the population of when just... You say, when you say numbers, are you talking about... Um, when you say numbers, you're talking about as far as the finances of... Finance yeah, well, I'm talking about both both population and, like and corporate. corporate. Yeah, like okay, that's how many big companies are based in... Um, Tasmania, well, a lot of left that were there. There's Cadbury's, and, and that's about it that I can think of off the top of my head. Now, yeah. there's a lot of farming, don't get me wrong, and, you know, it's seafood, and that's massive down there as well. But when you think of the population of Greater Western Sydney alone is something like three and a half million. That's that, ridiculous. That's three times more than Tassie. So um, it's about where the population growth is, and the population growth isn't in Tasmania. No, right. So the answer isn't easy, but what they do need to do is get some good footy heads down there running it. I know the AFL's working on that at the moment. Okay, now um, we are, well the round, round 23 is uh, run and done for the year, um, obviously Richmond are out in front, now Ricky I'm, I'm really keen to know your opinion on, on who, who's going to go all the way uh, this year, who's going to be competitive and who's going to make the, the grand final and also uh, your prediction for the Brownlow medal. Okay, well, as far as winning the Premiership, I've got I've had a pretty good run the last five years. I've got Hawthorne right three years in a row, in the March, let me say, not not at the end of the season. So okay. in March, I picked Hawthorne three years in a row. I then picked Geelong twice, who let me down both times in prelims, but they've got to the second last game of the year, so yep. that's not bad. Okay. Um, this year, I thought Sydney could go all the way, and my surprise packet would be Hawthorne. If you want to read anything into anything, I was the only media expert last year who picked Richmond to finish in the top six, and I said they'd be the surprise of the comp. Well, okay. I didn't realise that word surprise would be so instrumental so, because they won the so premiership. So dominant in the end. So guess who I picked this year to be top six? I picked Hawthorne to be top okay. six. And we're talking back in March. Back in March. Back, back yep. in March, I picked yep. Hawthorne to be top six. Yes, they've surprised me they finished fourth, probably. Yeah. Um, but And I said they'd be the Richmond, the surprise of the comp. Yeah. So I'm still, um, I, the way I see it is Richmond keep playing like they're playing, they win it. But if Hawthorne beats them in two weeks' time or a week's time, whenever this is goes to air, it's going to be a great is, night. Is I, I actually it wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise They've got the best coach going around. They've also got players like Gunston and Bruce who have lived in the shadow of Blue Codge, Mitchell Knight, who've suddenly stepped up in the last six weeks yep. to become gun not gun players but just leaders. And you can see that yeah. Hawthorne just keep this ball rolling. As soon as they start to go to that, they come back up again like really quickly. Whereas Carlton go down there and they just can't seem to come back <laughs> out again. Well, it's, 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 uh, it's a funny thing that you said that. Alistair Clarkson two years ago knew exactly what he was doing. Correct. We talk, we talk about the master code. Yep. Right, got rid of the old, old brigade. Yep. Right, traded them off. Lewis, yep. um, Mitchell over the West Coast. Then Hodgie was meant to retire, but obviously went to Brisbane in the yep. end. But he knew exactly what he was doing. Got Tamira in, got uh, yep. Tommy Mitchell in, who's the yep. Brownlow favourite this year. And it's just amazing how quickly it turns. One bad season, and yep. then as you said... Uh, the surprise packet there, the Richmond of yep. 2018. So the reason I also went with Hawthorne is when, when Alistair Clarkson I know had the biggest offers on the table to look at Collingwood, Buckley failed, go to St Kilda, you name it. He knocked him back to stay at Hawthorne. That says to me the greatest coach of all time knew there was another premiership in the next three years to be got, and it might be a year before he he thought it was going to be. I reckon that yep. it could be this year. It's probably a bit more unlikely than likely. Yeah. But t you heard it first on the chicken trainer for Hawks get up. Um, <laughs> Love it, chicken trainer. There it goes. But no, it's there for Richmond to lose at the moment. It's there for Richmond to lose. Okay. Yep. Now, um, what I'm going to tell you, Windows Worship, okay? Windows Worship is basically, uh, it could be past, or, uh, we'll, we'll rephrase it. Windows Worship is your past, yep. um, greatest sporting, so you go to any sport, yep. okay? So any sport that is. Yep. So uh, you mentioned Jordan. And yep. then Windows Worship is your current Goat. So, yeah. someone from back in the day, who's yeah. your goat, and then who's your current goat uh, in the current day? So, that's what we call uh, Windows Worship. Well, it's two guys that I have the privilege of having it manage, and when they first started in AFL football, one's the obvious, of course, Wayne Carey, um, greatest the player duck. I've seen. But I've, I say this on every time I speak to is he's the greatest player I've seen, but the most freakish and the best player to ever watch was Gary Ablett Sr. I mean, 
you know, the two of them were different players. Yeah. Gary wasn't as consistent as Wayne, but Gary kicked 14 goals three times in a home and away game. No one's ever done anything like that. It's freakish. He took big marks, but Wayne perhaps didn't quite take the big speckies, but Wayne was so consistently good. It's, yeah. it's amazing. And then I think Dustin Martin's the, the 2000 and sort of 18 onwards, Wayne Carey, a different sort of player, oh, yeah. but very dominant, very powerful. Um, he's almost in between Ablett and um, Carey. You know, he's not, he's not a key forward. Very marketable. Yeah, very marketable. Um, look, he's a people's person. Um, the, the, them to me is the sort of hero worship stuff that you have. Um, and the, the player that uh, I have actually got to know this year, but I really, really like him, and he's a Matthew Richardson of the current playing crop, and that's Max Gorn. Maxie and Gorn. I'd love to see Maxie Gorn win not only the uh, Brownlow, but um, even the Premiership and Norm Smith. I've told him that the Norm Smith's there for him to win. I actually put it in a text and screenshot of it. Okay. So I didn't quite finish my Premiership predictions before. It's there oh, for Melbourne. Richmond to lose. But Melbourne are my big yeah. outsider who could go past them all. The Hawthorne's best. the one in between, if that makes sense. So if you want an outsider, it's Melbourne. If you want one to surprise, it's Hawthorne. And if you want the winner, it's Richmond. Yeah, OK. So you, you, you're, uh, you're narrowing it down to three. That's right. Three and, and I think, you know, Collingwood having to travel to Perth and the injury's too hard. GWS too hard. Geelong, it's a long way to come from sort of eighth to, to win it. Oh, and gee, yeah. uh, who else have I left out? Uh, there's one of oh, West Coast Eagles. Their injuries and they have to come to Melbourne, I think might, mightn't help them either. But uh, the Brownlow medal, Tom Mitchell for me from Max Gorn. Okay. All right. There we go, Rick. Yeah, this is a little bit of a joke. Okay. You don't have to answer this because I will edit it, mate. So, uh, Warwick Kappa. Kappa was known for taking knife flies. What's the highest uh, you have ever seen Kappa? Uh, Saturday night. Saturday night? Chicken okay. goes bang. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a, look, he's a great bloke. Uh, Warwick, he's different. I love him to death. He's quite funny. Um, and when we do shows, I must admit, sometimes like, he says things, I just go like that. But I watch the crowd, and I think if Ricky, Ricky Nixon just said what he said, I'd be headlines in the paper tomorrow. But they laugh at Warwick because that's Warwick. And look... 32 years he's been going on the speaking circuit and it's you know like, like me and everybody else if you're successful you get haters and people bagging him but you know what there's not no one in australia has been on the, the circuit of speaking for 32 years yep. so he's a unique character he's something the game is missing and and i love I think that i think that's the problem with the game currently yeah. You don't have the character. No, you don't. Of the no. history, uh, and it's a shame, and it's not going to, once again, it's one of those things, the more we are, it's not going to change. Yeah. Um, but I wish the players could just have a little bit more freedom of speech. There's been a couple of players this year, like Nick, I think it's Nick Robinson of Brisbane, who spoke his mind a couple of weeks ago, and oh my God, he got canned for it, and he shouldn't have said it, and, yep. and all this sort of thing, and it's like, God, oh, just let them speak. We don't have to bag everyone for everything they do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Ricky? Well, Ricky, um, we've covered just about everything for today um, I do appreciate appreciate you coming on uh, Winnow's World you've been been a gentleman uh, the chicken train now as we're going to uh, depart the show would you mind giving uh, the audience what they want and that's a, a toot toot and the chicken train <laughs> yep all aboard the chicken train toot toot and well done Winnow good stuff brother thank you very much Cheers. mate thank you very much you're a legend <laughs> <laughs>